Christ is risen. I welcome all of you who are online and here in person with us this morning to Easter Sunday here at Wyoming Baptist Church. It is so very good to see you and to worship with you this Easter. Last Easter, as many of you know, we weren't. And it was a wild new time. New time. So this past week has been a time of walking with Christ from his triumphal entry to the cross. And this morning, we now look at the grave, and it's empty, and we celebrate his resurrection from the dead. Paul says that Christ, the resurrected one, is the firstborn of us, the first one of us to be raised from the dead, which means that what we, what we look at today is a foretaste, a foretaste of our future, our future hope. And so I encourage you this morning um, to look at this as exactly that, as this hope for our future born in the past. So Christ is risen. One day we will too. Let us worship our Lord and Savior this morning by beginning in a word of prayer. Will you join me? God, we come before you on this resurrection day to celebrate you, but not just you, to celebrate the fact that you have begun this process of making the world new, of healing us of sin, of death, of evil, of conquering all the things that bring us down, that drag us into hell. You have cut those strings and freed us to find life with you. And so we pray this morning as we remember this time, this most pivotal time in our history, in all of human life, your resurrection, we pray that you would guide us and lead us closer to your throne, closer to heaven, closer to you, and so closer to each other. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again. Amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines drained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain 
the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The New Testament reading for today comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 1 through 11. So this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, I'm sorry, proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, and which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaimed to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as a first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so you have come to believe. And lastly, our gospel reading for today is from Mark chapter 16, verse 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Well, good morning. Come join us. You want to sit on the steps? Here you go. Well, happy Easter. <laughs> well, good morning. Come right up here and sit down. It's so good to see you all. Happy Easter to you. Oh, now Marty's changed his mind. This is good. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you all get Easter baskets this morning? No? No, okay. Well, you know, one of the big things at Easter time is we get Easter baskets, we get candy, we get maybe stuffed animals, things like that. That's the fun part, isn't it? Well, I brought my Easter basket this morning to show you. Okay? You like this bunny? So in here, I got a bunny, a beanie baby bunny. What's it? You have these? Oh, upstairs. Okay. That, well, this is, my, this is one of my bunnies. And these are kind of symbols of Easter. You know, when we think of a bunny, we oftentimes think of Easter, don't we? You want to hold him for me? And I don't know. What's his name? Floppity. Floppity. That's a cute name. Now, also, oh, oh my goodness, there's candy in there. I got candy in my Easter. There's foil eggs and there's... There's a little Reese's thing with a bunny on top, so I got candy. Now, this is an egg that, gosh, I've, I've seen, I've had this before in my Easter baskets. And you know what's fun about this egg? Is it opens up. And there's always something in it. So should we see what's in it? Okay. I'm going to put this right here. Now we're curious, aren't we? <gasps> oh, it's empty. There's nothing in there. Oh, well, you're ahead of the game. Okay, we're finished now. We can go. <laughs> this is it. There's nothing in it. That's kind of disappointing, isn't it? Because there's nothing there. Well, that's okay. We'll put it back in here. Now, why, why do you think I have a white handkerchief in my Easter basket? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense either, does it? We'll just kind of stick that right back down there. Let me have Bunny. Now, we're going to talk about that egg again in just a minute, Okay. So this is Easter Sunday. This is the Sunday that we have been waiting for, the day we've been waiting for all through Lent. This is what we prepare for. This is a celebration of Easter. To me, it's the highlight of the Christian calendar, and I think for a lot of people. I like Christmas, but Easter is the best because it's the resurrection of Jesus. Now, you know, Jesus died on the cross. He was laid to rest in the tomb, and a big stone was rolled over, just like Pat read in the scripture this morning. And then some of his friends went there on Easter Sunday, and they wanted just to see that everything was okay. And when they got there, the stone had been rolled away, and they went inside, and Jesus wasn't there. All that was there was just the cloth that he was wrapped in. And it was just like this, empty. And they were afraid because they thought, what has happened to him? And they were kind of puzzled. <clears throat> and then an angel appeared and told them that Jesus had risen, just like he had promised. And this is like when we opened the egg, and it was empty, and we were very disappointed in that, weren't we? But when the women went to the tomb, and it was empty, it was amazing, and they were so excited, and they were so surprised, because what Jesus had said to them had come true. Now, you know, when I do my children's messages, oftentimes I like to send you home with something that reminds you about what we talked about. And today, we talked about the resurrection of Jesus and what that means for us. He died for our sins so that we can, we can live forever. And it isn't the candy that makes us remember that? It isn't the bunnies that make us remember that or the Easter eggs. It's the cross. And so I have a cross for each one of you to take home today. And I want you to hang this someplace where you remember it. And whenever you look at the cross, you remember that Jesus died for your sins. He is with you always. And it's a, it's a reason to celebrate. It's a reason to be happy. Does that make any sense? Okay, now I have a cross for you. And I have a cross for you. Marty, 
you want to cross? Because I have one for you. And it's got, there you go. So celebrate today. This is a day of celebration on Easter Sunday. Would you pray with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the fact that he died for us so that we could have life ever after and that our sins would be forgiven. I thank you, Lord, for these children on this Easter Sunday. Be with them and protect them. Bring them back and so that we can worship together next Sunday. In your Son's name we pray, amen. Thank you for being such good listeners. Bye, Bye Hoppy. <laughs>
Good job. All right, Luke, welcome. I hope after the service today, we can all welcome them in person with uh, elbow bumps um, and whatever's appropriate. Um, and so I encourage you to do so afterwards today as we continue to celebrate um, the resurrection of our Lord and new life. Someone once said that the resurrection of Jesus was simply God's unwillingness to take our no for an answer. That the resurrection was God's unwillingness to take our no for an answer. That he raised Jesus not as an invitation so much for us to go to heaven when we die, but as a declaration that he himself has now established permanent residence here on earth. Permanent residence on earth. God is standing, in other words, beside you, beside you, strengthening you in life. The good news then of the resurrection of Jesus that we celebrate today is not that so much that we should die and go home to be with him, but that he has risen and made his home here, here, with all of us, saving this world, destroying death from the inside out. That's resurrection. So let us now welcome in this resurrected Lord as we enter into our time of prayer this morning. Will you pray with me? Holy God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. You are the true almighty king, the Lord of love, the crucified one. You bring light out of darkness, mercy out of guilt, hope out of fear, life out of death. We come to you on this day of resurrection, welcoming you back from the grave, back from hell. We come giving thanks that your love is abounding, that it knows no limits, that it breaks down walls, that it enriches everything it touches, that it heals all wounds. And we worship you because you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son, in whom we have redemption itself, the very forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. We worship you because in your resurrection you defeated death once and for all. You took that demon by the horns and threw him down and left him in the tomb, power gone, grip fading, his time at an end. You made the mortal immortal, the perishable imperishable, the impossible possible. As death conquered Adam through a tree, so your son Jesus conquered death through a cross. The parallel is wondrous, the outcome glorious. So we give you thanks today, this week, and always. In doing so, we lift up new life, Luke Baringhouse and his family. We pray that you would guide us as we seek to be the people of God for Luke, to raise him up into that same resurrection life that you give all of us. We thank you as well for success in surgery for Mike Habistak, who we've been praying for for so long. Um, successful removal of this tumor and the lymph nodes and the fantastic um, review after looking at them. And we thank you for the success on what looked like a dire picture, God. And we pray for his recovery um, these next few weeks and months. In the midst of these celebrations of new life, though, God, we remember that your resurrection is both here already and yet not fully. We remember Pam Brunk, who passed away this last week. We remember her life, and we remember as well on this resurrection day that you are the firstborn for the de from the dead and that you have promised to raise her up. In the same way, we remember Autumn and Chris Amex and the entire Amex and Singleton family at the loss of Autumn and Chris's unborn child. We pray for Autumn. We pray for Chris. We pray for Landon and Asher. 
We pray that you give them your presence, your comfort, your strength. We pray that you receive their child into your open arms of love and that one day in the same hope that we celebrate today, we may meet together again in the resurrection of the dead. We continue to pray for Wes Adamson, Karen Clary, Bob Henschel, Michael Johnson, Ron Lucan, Janice Meyer, and Dave Shaw, who all continue to struggle with cancer and other diseases that are recurring. We pray that you pour your spirit into them and give them strength and the life that comes in your resurrection too. We pray for our neighbors and our world, a world that continues to seem like it's being torn apart in so many different ways. We pray that you pour hope, not only into our lives and our visions, but into reality, into these spaces, into these pains, into these hurts, into these lives that strike out and hurt others. We pray for resurrection life to come into every single human heart, to heal us all from the inside out, to write that law of love upon our souls so that we will know it and know you and know each other perfectly. We pray for this day to come soon, for the love of God to be visible to all of us and all who witness to your crucified life and the suffering that you shared with us and for us. God, these are our prayers today on this day of resurrection. We pray that you heal us, that you forgive us, that you guide us, that you bring us to newness of life. And we ask these things together in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, by praying the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So the Gospel of Mark is full of a lot of unexpected twists and turns. At one point, we find Jesus with a large group of people on the seashore. He's teaching them using a parable, the parable of the sower. Afterwards, the disciples, they're curious about what it means, and they ask, why do you tell stories like these, like these parables, instead of being straightforward? 
Why don't you talk straightforward, Jesus? To which Jesus replies, so that the people may look but not perceive. So that they can look but not perceive, listen but not understand. That's why I teach in parables. Does anybody else find that strange? This is a guy who started out here in the Gospel of Mark, telling people to repent and believe, and now he's intentionally teaching them in a way that they won't. That's got to be a little odd. There's also, in Mark, a number of times when Jesus just seems to fail. Jesus fails. Like in Mark 8, when he tries to heal a blind man, only it doesn't quite work the first time, so he has to do it again. Or when Jesus is actually walking down Main Street of Nazareth and then decides to stop and perform a, a little miracle here and there, but he, he can't do it then either. Mark tells us that Jesus couldn't do any deeds of power there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. So if I didn't know any better, it sounds like in Mark, Jesus sometimes just has these off days. All of these curiosities, by the way, in Mark, they go beyond Jesus, too. There are four Gospels in the Bible. All of them tell the story of Jesus' passion, all right? This time between his triumphal entry and his uh, resurrection, all right? But Mark adds this strange and really unique little detail after Jesus gets arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is what he says. He says, everybody deserts Jesus. Everybody runs away except for one unknown, strange guy, someone we've never heard about before. A certain young man, Mark says, who is wearing nothing but a linen cloth. Everyone runs away when Jesus is arrested except for this kid, a kid in his underwear. And when the soldiers tried to grab this kid, Mark tells us that he escapes by taking even that off. When's the last time you've seen that in a passion play? So maybe we shouldn't be all that surprised when we get to the end of Mark's resurrection story, the very end of the book, and we find out that Jesus never actually shows up anywhere. Jesus doesn't show up. Feel free, by the way, to grab a Bible. There are a lot in the backs of those pews. And look with me at Mark 16. Turn over to Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. This is the story again. When the Sabbath was over, Mark says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices. Three women bring spices so they may go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from, for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He has been raised you were look, you know, sir, he has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is a place right there where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. For there you will see him just as he told you. But they do nothing of the sort. Mark tells us at the end that they go out. They fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And right there, in fear, in silence, is where Mark ends. If you're looking in your Bibles, you might see some extra stuff put in there after that, but almost every single scholar agrees that this extra stuff was added after the fact that it was most likely put there precisely because Mark's story is so weird. No one could quite understand why he would just stop, stop and end things right there without anybody in the story actually seeing Jesus raised from the dead. All the other Gospels, Luke, Matthew, John, they have these resurrection appearances, but not Mark. Mark, Mark just has silence. 
silence. Personally, I kind of like it. I like it. I like the way Mark ends his story right here with silence because I think it fits life. I think it fits normal life. How many of you struggle with the idea that somebody literally rose from the dead? You can be honest. It's church. Nobody is going to strike you down. How many of you, if we think back just a few days ago, think back just to Good Friday, all right? How many of you struggle with the idea that it wasn't just anybody who died up there on that cross, but it was God himself? How could this possibly happen? What would it even mean to say that God, the creator of the world, the immortal one, the one who can't die, how can this God die? What would that mean? I'll be honest with you. Um, I struggle with this. It's hard to know what in the world that means. And the fact is, if you're anything like me in this, we're actually in pretty good company. For a long time, for a long time, even way long after Jesus had died and rose again, the idea that God could die was considered an absolute impossibility. God can't die. Not really. In fact, according to classical Greek culture and philosophy, the culture that stands behind so much of the Bible, especially the New Testament, God, it's not just that he can't die, God can't even feel. He can't even feel. He cannot change, so he cannot go from life to death, living to dying, nor can he suffer pain or even, and this is part of the craziest part, it may be a little bit surprising, nor can God even experience joy. Joy. God, the Greek said, is beyond all these human emotions. And the reasoning, their logic, was actually simple. If God could feel, and if God could change, all right, if God could feel, and if God could change, then that would mean that something outside of God was impacting him. That something outside of God would, would have been bigger than God, more powerful. It would be able to move God in a sense. It could even control God, change the things that he does. So something outside of God would be able to change him, move him, it'd be bigger. It could force him to do something, whether God wanted to do it or not. So to say that God suffers and dies is to say that God is at somebody else's mercy. It's to say that God is underneath somebody that God is below. But God can't be underneath or below anybody because God is God and there's nothing below God. There's nothing more powerful to, than him, right? Isn't that right? So God, it's thought, can't change. He can't feel. He most certainly cannot die. This was the thinking until three women. Three women find a young man dressed in a white robe sitting right where Jesus should have been in an otherwise empty tomb. And they hear that God did. This is the shocking history of Christian belief. The impossible becomes possible. And it's one of those things standing behind the silence that we hear in Mark 16. We could go even deeper, by the way, into that silence. Deeper even than the incomprehensibility of a dying and rising God. How many of you struggle with the thought that there's just, there might just not be hope out there? There might just not be that much hope out there. How many of you are tempted to look back over the past year, maybe, maybe in the past century, filled with wars and rumors of wars and violence and racism, and terror, and so much more everyday pain? How many of you are tempted to look back at all of this and think to yourself, not, not quite like Louis Armstrong, what a wonderful world, but goodness, it really is quite bad out there. I think we can all sit here, we can smell these flowers, we can bask in the amazing sunshine outside, we can go fishing tomorrow in Springfield. I just gave you a little hint of what I'm doing, all right. But if we, consider, if we consider the grand scope of things, all right, then whew, there's a lot out there 
that's not good. It's not easy to believe, to have hope, to think of life out of death today. Sometimes on Easter, even on Easter, maybe especially on Easter, in our heart of hearts, there's silence. There's the same silence that Mark talks about. So I think he might have known what he was doing, ending his story there. Today I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that it's okay to feel that way. It's okay. It's okay to feel a little tight-lipped today. It's okay to fear what you're being asked to believe here with all this talk of resurrection, to wonder and even doubt about, could it all be true? I'm honest, it's okay. I know that may be weird to hear somebody, a pastor up here, standing up here on Easter, the day of resurrection, telling you that it's okay if you find it all a little hard to believe. I get that that may be weird, that God died and rose again, and because of that we have hope that may be hard. It's okay, though. It's okay to feel that way because what God did a couple of days ago on Good Friday, being crucified on that cross, And what he did yesterday on Holy Saturday, descending into hell itself to free the people who were there. And now on Easter Sunday, what he did, by resurrecting from the dead, not a single one of these acts has anything to do with what we believe about it. Let me say that again, because it's important. Not a single one of these acts, from the crucifixion to the descent into hell to the resurrection, has anything to do with what we believe about it. These acts, they only have to do with God's power. With God's power. And it's a power that's so importantly drenched in love. Fleming Rutledge put it this way. She says, The radical message of Holy Week is this, that on the cross, the Lord takes the part of those who are condemned and God forsaken, those who are on death row, those who have been abandoned even by their families, those who are cast out of society and have no one to take their part. On the cross, Jesus takes the part of the God forsaken, she says, the God forsaken, God takes the part of those who are forsaken by God. We have to let that sink in. The God forsaken didn't ask God to hop up there on that cross. They never have anything to do with it. Jesus just does it. He just does it. You see, when Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's becoming with with all of the cast out He's becoming one with all the cast out and God forsaken people of the world. And when he prays up there on that cross that God would forgive the very people who nailed him there, this brings us, this brings us deep into the very heart of God. We get an honest look at what God is truly like. And what we find is a God, Rutledge says, who has extended his love into the deepest places of the human soul, even into hell itself. Luke gives us a set of parables in his gospel that talks about this idea that it's all God and not us in a strange way. A shepherd, Jesus says, has a hundred sheep. Realizing he's lost one of them, he leaves the other 99 sheep and goes out and searches for the one that he's lost. A woman has 10 coins, realizes she's lost one of them. She goes turning everything over in her house until she finds it. And then she throws a party with all of her neighbors to celebrate when she does. A father loses a son. He goes off into a faraway country to waste his life away, only to then see his dad running at him. Full speed, arms open wide, the very second that his dad catches him on the road, 
Now, according to Luke, Jesus tells these parables. The reason he tells the parable of the sheep and the coin and the son, he tells them supposedly that we can know just how happy God and the whole host of heaven are when one sinner repents. That's what Luke says. These parables teach us how happy God is when a sinner repents. The only problem is they don't do anything like that. A lost coin can't repent. A sheep can only say, bah, that's not quite there yet. The only person in these three parables that can repent, the only figure is the lost son. The lost son. But his father actually isn't interested at all in the apology that he's worked up. He just blows right by it and gives him the biggest hug you could ever imagine. This is the depth of God's love. It's the kind of action that defines Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, everything he'll do to save us and to heal this world. It's an action that's all God's own. All his own. All his own. God doesn't need us to believe in it for it to be true. He doesn't need us to believe in it for him to do it because God's love is quite bigger than that. It doesn't depend upon us. I tell the story of a guy named Luigi Orion a lot at Easter because I always think it is perfect for giving a picture of the depth and the power of God's love. Luigi Orion was a priest who lived in Italy during um, the beginning of World War II during the Mussolini era, and he fought passionately against um, fascism. Toward the end of Luigi's life, he was sick in bed, and he began to think about death. He began to think about death, and it led him to pray, and he prayed that when he died, he hoped that God would set him down at the gates of hell so that he could keep them shut against all comers, so that he could keep them shut against all comers. Not keeping people in hell, but keeping people out of it. That, my friends, is the depth of God's love for us, whether we believe it or not. So, we can be forgiven if the resurrection sounds a bit far out, or if the idea that God died seems wildly paradoxical, because it's not about what you can do, or even about what you can believe. It's about turning, turning, collapsing into the arms of God who's already got them enfolded around you. It's about a God who would follow you even into the very depths of hell to save you and make you whole. It's about a God who would give up immortality because it's not as important as you. This is the God that we believe in. This is the God. This is the only God worth believing in. A God who loves us enough to die for us. So today of all days, you're allowed to struggle a little bit. To wonder, to question, even to doubt. Because God isn't going anywhere. We're all allowed, in fact, to echo this cry that we only find in Mark's gospel, by the way, a cry of the desperate father who only wants Jesus to heal his son. I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. We're allowed that because like those women who first experienced the empty tomb, we're all going to have moments of fear and silence sometimes even profound disbelief. The world out there does that to us. Death and pain, they surround us. A death that pains our very souls even. Maybe more this year than most. Depression, confusion, disappointment, loss. All these things make it a little hard to believe sometimes that everything is somehow going to turn all right. But God, through all of it, still loves us. Still loves us. That's the real story behind Good Friday and Easter Sunday. It's that God still loves us, even 
in our silence. Even in our silence. We know from history that the women, they eventually do step out. But not, I think, because they figured it all out. Because they had some sort of come to Jesus moment about the resurrection there. It was probably still wildly amazing, even confusing. But they stepped out because they remembered, I think, a word. A word we also heard already today. A word of the Lord on this mountain. The Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-aged wines. They remembered what that promised. For on this mountain he will destroy the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. They remembered what it meant that on this mountain God will swallow up death forever, that he will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. And then they knew this is a God who loves. This is a God who loves us. So we trusted in him and he saved us. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The same word comes to all of us, not expecting us to understand how it works or how God might just accomplish it, but simply inviting us to receive what has already been given, to fall into those arms already around us, to bring our heads full of doubt and our hearts full of worry and say, and say, there is patience where there is grace. There is healing where there is forgiveness. There is hope where there is love. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen. Part of all this comes in what we celebrate at the table of Jesus Christ. The reason we have bread and wine is it represents the body, the broken body, and the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And the reason we continue to celebrate it is because God is resurrected, and it's available to us because of that. Jesus says in John 6 that if we eat of his body and we drink of his blood, we will have eternal life with him. And he invites us all to come. He invites us all to come. All you have to do is that. You come. You come. So this morning, you are welcomed. You are invited. Invited to just turn around and embrace the God who's already embracing you by taking his body and his blood. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your death and your resurrection. We thank you for coming, becoming one of us, to heal us from the very inside out, to doom death, to destroy it, to drink it dry, and to replace in its stead life, life everlasting, life through your body, life through your blood. We come this morning as we come into this time of celebration, of communion, of sharing in your supper with your body and blood, God. We pray that you would pour your spirit upon these things, upon us, upon our hearts, upon this bread, upon this wine, so that what is ordinary can become extraordinary. What is mortal can become immortal. What is perishable, imperishable through your love and power alone. Alone. God, fill us up with your body, with your love, with your bread, with your wine, with your blood. And then raise us up to newness of life. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, by the way, if you have those little cups, now's the time. Um, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, after giving thanks, um, he broke bread. And he said, 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this cup and you eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This testimony of resurrection, the blood of Christ, take and drink. And now a little foretaste of our future. Will you stand and sing with everyone around you? Blessed be the tie that binds the community of the saints, the love of the world. Thank you for joining us this Easter here at Wyoming Baptist Church. I am very thrilled to see you all, um, and I hope you have a glorious rest of this Resurrection Sunday. You're dismissed. <laughs>